You know, promotion is God experiencing himself through you, so that's, that's why he lifts you up. Promotion is better than pride, and promotion is better than perversion. Because in promotion, it means that you get to experience a new uh, level of information with the Holy Spirit, like the Holy Spirit can graduate you to the next class. You notice when you're in first grade, you hear certain things that you don't hear when you're in third grade and fourth grade. Like each grade level, there's a different curriculum. And so David, when he was um, feeding the sheep, that angle of operation had a knowledge that was in alignment with feeding the sheep. But to kill Goliath, it's another knowledge because he takes out a stone. He throws a stone. We never see him throw a stone at a bear or a lion. But he throws the stone at a giant, which shows that even his knowledge has switched because we never see him do this before. So he's operating in a different knowledge. He's operating in a different understanding. And that shows that his teaching from the Holy Spirit is different. Remember what David went from killing Goliath to now slaughtering all the Philistines. So now you also see another change in the knowledge. Because if you're killing more of the enemies, you know that your knowledge to kill has increased and advanced. The same way, Solomon was anointed to listen to his mother and his father, Solomon, uh, uh, David, and Bathsheba. But then the anointing switches to him seeking God for himself. Then the anointing switches to him leading other people into that same like anointing. Then that anointing switches to become a sower. Then that anointing switches to become a reaper. So you see the graduation of how promotion is better than pride. And promotion is better than perversion. And promotion is better than pollution. Matthew chapter 15 verse 11 it says, now that which goeth into the mouth does not defile a man. But that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. I say, I want to talk to you about this major dimension in the spirit of how the mouth defiles. Defilement the word defile in the Hebrew, one of the meanings for it is to contaminate. If you're familiar with contaminated water, it is water that when people drink it, it makes them ill because there are things inside of that water. It attacks the stomach, the belly. It attacks the bodily health of the individual and they become very sick. The word contamination means that something becomes deadly. Now the word dead is a word that means that you become disconnected from the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible says in Psalms, it says the dead do not praise the Lord. But these people are on earth. So they are not declared dead according to their existence, but they are dead according to their consciousness of what God needs. So there is a realm of death that you're still in the body. But your mind is not operating to please God. Are you hearing me? There's a realm of death where you are still in your physical body. But your brain has no 
consciousness or awareness of what God needs from you. So always remember this. If you're taking notes, remember this, that death is detachment from God's longings. Wow. If you're taking notes, write that down. Death is detachment from God's longings, which means that what God longs for from you, you're not in a mental place to give it to him. So when you understand the, the, the place of death, remember what um, death is what Jesus destroyed at the cross. All right. Which means that Jesus destroyed a consciousness that would detach you. It is detached from God's preference. See, the cross was so mighty because it was the place where God said, I'm going to destroy a system within the soul where man becomes disconnected from me and it becomes all about them. See, you got to understand, Satan's greatest avenue to create a slave is through selfishness. Selfishness is the avenue in which Satan creates slaves and prisoners. Let me show you. Because the minute that you involve yourself and make yourself the priority, what you say, what you think, and what you do becomes a complete defilement against the image of God you was made to walk in. So here's what the devil has done with selfishness. If I can make you selfish, I already have the power to cause all that I did to God in my history. I can now duplicate myself through you. Oh my goodness. I hope you're hearing me. What Satan does through selfishness is repeat Satan's history in your body. So now all Satan does is I was able to complete this when I was in rebellion towards God. If I get you into selfishness, I'll do the same thing. So I want you to look at this from this angle. Promotion is better than pride. In pride, there is no progress. Your life is on repeat. There are sessions of your days on earth that is exactly the same that it was the other day. God is a broken record in the life of those that are broken demonically. There was one day I was with my sons inside of the gym. Um, we were live. I was with Bennett. I was with uh, Makai. I was with Juan. I told them while we were in the gym, watch this here, we're playing basketball. I told them, I said, if these people come in, uh, we're going to basically leave. Like if they talk with us, we're going to leave. Like we're not going to play basketball with them. We're going to leave the gym. So while we were playing basketball, I want you to listen to this. When we walked into the basketball place, and while we we're playing, they walked in. A guy was trying to get my attention. I ignored him. I saw him signaling my sons. They ignored him too. They weren't paying no attention. They stayed focused. Now watch this here. Something began to happen where it's like, in response, they wanted us to just move off the court. But I had already told my sons, we just going to leave. Like, we're not going to play no games with them. We're just going to leave. Okay. That was day one. Day two. 
I came into the gym the same day with my same sons. The next day. We were playing basketball. We played all of our games. And then the people came in. When we were leaving. And I told my sons, see, today is a repeat of yesterday. What happened yesterday did not bring the Holy Spirit pleasure. So I wanted, I really wanted to film and do a teaching with them. But the Holy Spirit said, go to the gym again. Because what I wanted didn't happen. Oh, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. The day when I brought Juan and my other sons into the gym some months back, there was a muscle guy that came up to Juan and wanted to make it hard on Juan, but Juan has a percentage of my spirit. Not fully, but a percentage. And what Juan did was he studied me. I didn't get into no debate with the man. I could have because legally I have the authorization to bring Juan because that's what I paid for. But I didn't get into no feud. And he was going back and forth, issue, 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 issue. Then finally he released Juan. He was going through the computer system. Okay, so watch this here. When I went back to that gym, the guy could, he looked at us and couldn't get out his seat. I want you to listen very closely to me. He couldn't get out of his seat. He stared at us the same way he stared the last time, but he couldn't move. You can look at his face and know that he wanted to do the same thing. Somebody else, he had to let somebody else handle us. When the person went inside of the computer system, the computer system crashed. Now, I had more sons in this equation, so that I, it would mean that I would have to pay for at least one of them. But the man said, you all can go, because there was no way for him to charge us because their computer system had crashed as soon as we was at the front desk. And the Holy Spirit said, I replayed back when he went, go bother one. And while he was bothering Juan, now I play back the scenario, he can't bother Juan, and everything went smooth. Your life is going in a recycling bin. For years, there are some of you all, for 20 years, you've been going around the same mountain. The children of Israel went around 40 years. There are some of you all, you have been going around the same mountain for 20, three decades, two decades, 30 years, and you can't recognize that Satan is laughing at the fact that God is not able to work out his plan through you. Every day where God replays back the same thing, you do the same fruit. And see, when you get older in life, it starts to affect you all the more because then you start looking at where you live and you're like, I don't want to live here. You start looking at your finances and you say, I'm going to be rich one day. You start looking at your health and you say, I'm sick. But what you don't understand is the sickness that you have in your later years, it is just a result, a result of recycling. Remember what the word of God says right here. It is that which cometh out of the mouth that defileth a man. I'm in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11. 
is that which cometh out of the mouth, not what goes into the mouth. It's not what you digested. It's what you professed, confessed, declared what you uttered. It says that's what defiles a man. You know, they came to Jesus and they judged Jesus. By the way, I rarely wash my hands before I eat. I rarely, I, I rarely, I, I don't have any fear of colds. One day, uh, before I was doing the conference, uh, the lady that I have doing my hair, she was doing my hair and she started coughing. Then all this mucus and stuff. And <coughs> I was like, oh. And you know, then you start having thoughts in your mind like, hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no. It's like 17 hell no's just keep on like just repetitively, repetitively going through your mind. It's like, why am I hell no in all of a sudden? Like it's just. It's like your your brain crashed, like hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no. It's like it go to at least 17 times. It's not, I don't think it go over 17. It's like it stop at 17, and then it's like kind of get lower, like hell no, hell no. It like get lower, like it start whispering. But before I get to 17, it just like keep getting higher and higher, like you yelling, you yelling, like hell no, hell no, hell no, hell, 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 hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no. And then just simmer down. And then she started spitting and hawking and I was like, I, I started mimicking her because I'm like, how you get to that point? I don't got nothing in my transglycerides. Your transglycerides got all that. You got fraternities inside your transglycerides. You got fraternities. You got senators and congressmen in all your transglycerides. Don't think about it. And she, she she just started hawking and all this stuff. And I was like, I'm hawking. I'm like this. Saints, you ever wish that somebody didn't spit on you? Now, there's, there's, there's other side times where it's contrary. <laughs> there's other times where it's contrary. But you ever have a time where you wish that somebody don't spit on you? Because she was spitting, I was hoping that my neck didn't feel nothing wet at all. And saints, you got to understand <laughs> that the people, the people that um, do hair, they be having the worst health. Don't, don't quote me on that, but quote me on it. People that do hair, braid hair, sewing weave, whatever it is, they have the worst health. Like they'll party, they'll sleep late, they'll drink. They smoke, like they have the worst health. You ever notice that? Just study your hair lady. They have a cold when it's not even cold outside, man. How did you get a cold it's not cold outside, man? It'd be like 80 degrees outside and they got a cold. You're like, where did you get it from? I watched this here. She was coughing and hawking and hawk to her. Hawk to in it, and while her transglycerides were so inflamed and stuff like that, um, I know I was coming to a conference. I know I'm protected, but I, I was chilled and stuff like that. I knew nothing was going to touch me. And then um, I had, um, I was going to have someone else get their hair done by the same person. So what I did was I knew that I could withstand it. I placed my hand my palm of my hand over their face and smudge their face so that when the same person does their hair, they wouldn't get a cold. Wish they didn't get a cold. Just a point of contact with the Holy Spirit told me. Now watch this here. I was not concerned that what was inside of her system would be transferred to my system. You know why? Because my system is not accepting defilement. So even though me and her are in the same vicinity and she has something moving in her system, I'm not concerned about it moving in my system because my system is 
It's proof to her system. So even though those things were inside of her up and down, circulated up and down, it's moving through her body. It couldn't enter minds, though we're making contact. Saints, what I'm telling you is that what the Holy Spirit does when he puts you in a workplace, when he puts you in assignment, your destiny, your purpose, he on purpose going to have you rub sur uh, shoulders with people that have in their system what you don't have in yours. And it's your job to prove to God promotion is better than pride. Promotion is better than perversion. And I'm unwilling to defile myself. I become proof, iniquity proof, lust proof, fear proof, anxiety proof. I become hatred proof. I become rebellious proof. I become idle time proof in their presence. Because my light is what I have prioritized in my consciousness. See, the minute that God is giving you an opportunity to be trusted, he lets you confront the darkness that you say that you have power over. When God is ready to give you a chance to be elevated, he lets you encounter the same iniquity that you say that you have destroyed. If you find yourself submitting to it, the altar in which that demon, that familiar spirit operates, is still alive and well. What disturbs a righteous man is when after the blood has been shed, the cross has been successful, and the Holy Ghost has descended with all power. That an altar that is built by demonic and defeated beings is still able to have a say so in his life. There is nothing that angers a righteous man more than knowing that a spirit, a vampire that sucks life from people, which is connectivity to God, is still in existence and running free without any justice in their life. Let me just show you something. Jesus defeated all demonic powers, but all demonic powers is not defeated in your life. Let me show you something that's real profound. The reason why the word of God said, if any man take up his cross, you must take up your cross because taking up your cross means now it is you that's defeating the spirits. It's not Jesus no more. It's you doing it. You ever wondered why if Jesus's cross was all sufficient, all sufficient for me to say that I have defeated the demonic. Why would Jesus say to take up my cross? If all demonic powers was defeated for me, why would he tell me to take up a cross like he did? Well, we understand that when he took up his cross, 1 John chapter 3, 8 says that he destroyed the works of the devil. Colossians, I believe that's chapter 2. It talked about he spoiled principalities and powers made a public spectacle of them, shaming them. Colossians 3, Colossians 2. We also see that the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, he is the head of all principality and power. So we know what his cross did. His cross made him superior over all demons. His cross made him superior over all sin. His cross made him superior over all temptation. His cross made him superior over all evil thoughts. 
So here's the big clue. Here's the plot twist. So if Jesus himself is saying that I must take up my cross, if he's giving you the mandate to take up your cross, that means until you take up your cross, you're not superior to demons. They're superior to you in your mind, not according to truth, according to your mind. Let, let me just tell you something. Your mind is more real to you than truth that goes against your mind. Let me show you something. If you talk to somebody right now said, I have an infirmity for 38 years, and you say, well, do you want to be made whole? And they say, well, somebody let, they pit me in. They, they, people keep jumping before me before I could get healed. I, I, I need somebody to pit me in. I keep on losing out on the healing. And they talking to you about all these excuses. In that person's mind, they're not connected to the truth. Their mind is more important to them than the department of truth that's currently appearing to them. So in, when we deal with this, demons being defeated, it is not apparent in your mind until they can't defeat you. If a spirit could link up with your actions and they could say, he's doing what we do. She's saying what we say. So let us go make our abode with her. Let us go make our house with him. If they could link up to your ways and say that what you are currently doing and saying matches up to what they are doing and what they are saying, it is proof that demons are not defeated in you, in your mental state. So how do we fix this? The Bible says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. This is what I have studied in mankind. During the years of my background, the emphasis that the Holy Spirit was putting on me to deny myself. So when I got even in the presence of Dr. Mike Murdoch, I didn't work with Dr. Mike Murdoch for months. I worked with people that he had pit me underneath. I remember there was even a woman. She was a good worker now, mind you. So this is not on Dr. Mike Murdoch's, uh, this is not on his uh, intelligence. She was a good worker and she solved a lot of problems for him. But the woman had a problem with racism. One day, uh, for a period of time, I was assigned to work underneath the woman. And the woman, she said, you boy, you underneath me, boy. Do what I say, boy. This is what she said to me. There was another black young man around me, and he started going off. He started going crazy. You know what I did? I did what she said. You know why I did what she said? Because... If any man come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and follow me. That young man didn't deny himself. By the way, that young man has failed in life. He didn't become anything. He didn't produce anything. He didn't become anybody. He has failed. You know why? Because it wasn't so much what she was saying. It was the moment at hand, a platform being given to display God to God. Before anybody gets promoted in the earth, God has to be able to look at you and not even see you no more. The minute that God could look at you and see himself, you go from glory to glory, faith to faith. By the way, I ain't got no problems with that woman. That woman is dead, by the way. She's dead. And she died weeks after we had that encounter. I believe they found that woman inside of her place, lifeless. Dead. Dead. 
one day I was with Juan inside of a, a, a P.O. box. I was at my post office. And the anger of the Lord started to rise up in me. And I began to whisper to Juan. I told Juan, I said, uh, this lady doing us wrong. I'm paraphrasing. I said, this lady doing us real wrong. She had us waiting. She wouldn't even attend to us. And I was saddened. I was so grieved. Because I knew I was being uh, a recipient of evil in her heart. And she would look over and she like, I ain't. And she was calling people in front of us, a white, a white woman. I told Juan, I said, we're going to stand right here. But I said, uh, yeah. I told him some other things about that woman. As I stand before the Lord. The next day I went inside the P.O. box, the next time I went inside the P.O. box, not the next day, the next time. When I went inside the P.O. box, the next day, there was a memorial at her desk. The memorial at her desk said this. It said, the day she was born, to the day that she had died. I asked. The black lady that was inside of there. I said what happened to this lady. I said what happened. I said I see her memorial right there. I said what happened to her. This is what the black lady told me. She said she had left the post office. She was driving in her vehicle. And they said a long pickup truck, one of those uh, long foot truck, those, uh, you know, them freight train trucks. It said, they said they, they crashed into her car, dismembered the vehicle, dismembered her. The lady told me, she said, it was a cruel death. Saints, while that woman was doing that that day, she didn't understand that I was her way out. She was looking at me with evil, and she was actually upset with me because of the spirits that she had within her. Not knowing. Now, mind you, do you know, if they didn't take it down, I haven't been there, but that memorial is still up. They probably take it down by now. But that lady died. And she was young. She wasn't no 40, 50, 60, 80, 70, you know. And by the way, those ages are not old, by the way. What I'm just saying, like, she is... Um, she's in her, you know, her, um, her age is up. Like she's going up in the years. Like she's not up past those years. So don't, don't mistake me. If you 40 and 50, like those are, me and you both know those are the sexiest years of your life. Your 60, your, your, your 40s, your 50s, your, your, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. Because, you know, the people that's in their 20s right now, they don't know that they cross-eyed and stuff like that. They don't know that they look like, you know, they're with scissors hands right now. Um, so don't think that I'm throwing shade on those ages. But I'm just showing you like she was young in age. Saints, it's not what goeth into a man that defiles him and what come out of that man. You have to know who you are talking to and who you are dealing with. It is very true that most powerful people in most places where God lodges himself, you won't even see it as that because God most times 
will not do to you in a physical body what he could do. Remember, when they were talking to Jesus, they were saying, if you are this, show yourself. And he went and showed them. The temptation actually said, if thou be the son of God, I believe that's Matthew chapter 4, turn these stone into bread. And he never turned the stone into bread. The scary thing about God is that when he gathers all of your prayers and he gathers all of your words, he'll come to you in a way that you think not. He'll come to you in an hour you think not. And he'll give you a chance to perform what you said. I want you to hear this. He'll give you a chance to do what you vowed. If you ask God for his will, he will never ignore your prayer. He's actually going to pitch you where his will is. Just make sure that when God pitch you in his will, that you don't allow your will to remain. If any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. Denying yourself is doing what? It is you letting go of your will for God's will. If you ever notice, what are the key points in which God tries me on? He tries me on my will. What am I doing that's not even God's will? That I continue to do. What am I saying that's not even God's will. But I continue to say it. I want you to catch this. Anytime God rebukes you. Corrects you. If you ever looked at what is the purpose of the rebuke. It is your will. But with your own mouth you said that you want God's will to be done. But when God talks to you about his will not being done. The truth of the matter is we have birthed more scammers than sons. Because a scammer is someone that presents to you a plan to do something that they have no intent to do. Because if you Begin to confront a scammer, you'll recognize that they took your money without telling you that they wasn't going to do what they said they was going to do. They took the exchange, but they never exchanged what they told you they would exchange it with. Oh, my goodness. My question to you on today is, are you a scammer in the kingdom of heaven? Because you scam. You say that you are for one thing. But when God pits his hand on you to pressure it out. He doesn't see it. When you scam God, your mouth is bigger. Your mouth is bigger than your movements. I, 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 no, no, I want, you, I want to slow this down and say this real, real close to you. When you are scamming God, your mouth is bigger to you than your movements. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. All to Jesus. All to Jesus, I surrender. Okay, so how is the emotion still alive? How is how you raise your children still alive? How is your opinion still alive? How is your lust still alive? How does temptation still have life? How does your jealousy still have life? How does your Planning 
to do something that's not even in God's itinerary. How is that still alive? How is your dignity still alive? How is your image still alive? I want you to hear me. See, when that woman started talking to me and talking about, hey, boy, you heard what I said, you underneath me, boy. Do what I said. And the other young man, he started talking. He started voicing his opinion, but he didn't make it nowhere in life because the Bible said the flesh profiteth nothing. It is the spirit that giveth life. The words I speak to you, they are spirit and life. After he had voiced his opinion, he lost his dominion. After he had voiced his opinion, he lost his dominion. Because who are you performing for in that moment? Are you performing for the Holy Spirit that will say, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God? Are you performing for the Holy Spirit that said those that mourn, they shall be comforted? Matthew chapter 5. Are you performing for the Holy Spirit that says submit yourselves? See, he was willing to fight for a realm that wasn't even willing to fight for him. Oh, my goodness. I, I want you to hear me. When Satan betrays you, you recognize that you was fighting for something that Satan wasn't even willing to fight for you. Satan wasn't willing to fight for your cause. Satan has nothing to give you. After that young man did what he did, I still got promoted. I still got favor. I still got blessed. I still increased. Because in that moment, it was a platform for me to show that I had denied myself. I had taken up my cross. I told you, don't attach your salvation to a person on earth. You know why? Because the minute you create a partner with somebody and you say, this is my partner in Christ, we are both going to serve the Lord together. The minute that they start to disrespect God and walk in deception and ignore his voice and harden their heart to his will, and they start to get offended by certain things, and they start to say, no, this is not of God, and they start messing up. If you attach your salvation to them, you watch how your drive goes. You watch how your obedience goes, your focus goes, your, your commitment goes, your prayer goes. But when you walk this walk, this straight and narrow walk by yourself, you notice that you're never tainted by anybody. You notice that you could walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You notice that you could abide in him in the day and in the night. The Bible says something powerful once again, Matthew 15, 11. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man. It's what comes out of his mouth that defiles him. Matthew chapter 15, verse 11. The word of God said that what goes into your body, your mouth does not defile you. What comes out of your mouth defiles you. I told you one of the words for defilement in the Hebrew, in the meaning is contaminate. Also in the Hebrew, they begin to define it. It says that you make yourself impure. Remember what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, that blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It notice it used the key word pure. So if you become impure, that means that blindness overtakes you. You have no ability to see God. And remember, whatever you view becomes you. So if you can't see God, that means that you only can see the devil. And now what you view becomes you, so you have to become the devil. So what you are saying out of your mouth is making you more like Jesus or is making you more like the devil. I want you to hear this. I want you, I want you to recognize this. There is a realm where God gives you time and judgment to change these things. He gives you a time and then he judges you to see what have you done 
with my moments that I've given you to change this narrative. Are you going to choose the Lord's side, the Lord's table, or the table of the devil? Are you going to let your mouth defile you, or are you going to let your mouth, Proverbs chapter 12, I believe that's verse 6, are you going to let your mouth deliver you? Remember this, the mouth defiles or the mouth delivers. And everything that you say in the presence of God is either destroying you or is making you clean. I want to take you here lastly. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. This is going to shock you. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. This is going to shock your life. And you need to write this down on the tablets of your heart forevermore. Remember what I'm about to say unto you. In the book of Ecclesiastes, I elaborate this on another time. The book of Ecclesiastes, it says, it says this. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 4. Look what it says. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. So you understand that there's a realm of a fool where you say that you're going to do one thing and produce a fruit unto God. And then when the time comes for you to produce the fruit, you fight, you wrestle, you argue. You yield to temptation. You cater to your flesh. You don't pray for grace. I told you all that if you ever ask God for grace for something, the whole power of God enters your body. I did it the other day. Over 48 hours ago, I did it. And what I did it towards, because I don't want to be driven by any pleasure. The Bible says in Proverbs that the man that loves pleasure shall be a poor man. Why? Because people that love pleasure love Satan. When you love pleasure, that means that you will fight Moses, even though God picked Moses for you to submit. You will take from the enemy's camp, even though Joshua, your leader, said that God said, don't take from the enemy's camp. When you love pleasure, you'll love rebellion. You'll be Gehazi. Elisha says, I don't want nothing from you, Naaman. The pieces of silver, or gold, I don't want the clothes. But Gehazi say, hey, my master sent me to get the clothes. My master sent me to get the silver and the gold from you. And Gehazi lied. He lied on Elisha because this is what's inside of him. All right? All right? He didn't accept any empowerment from his man of God to be successful with his man of God. And they all chose, all these people I named, Samuel, Saul, Saul chose, I'm going to choose the evil part. I know that God anointed me to be good, but I'm going to choose evil because I have a will and my will is more in love with Satan than God. So even though I am anointed to be good, I'm going to choose evil. Saints, one thing that has shocked me over my years in ministry, I've watched people, even though they are anointed by God, I've Watch them with my own eyes. I don't need nobody to tell me, hey, uh, you know, you, you know the story about in the Bible when this happened? No, I don't need nobody. I watch with my own eyes how people love darkness more than light. I've watched it with my own eyes. The last 15 years of my life, I've been studying mankind. I've been studying people. I've been studying Male and female. I've been studying boys and girls. And I've been watching. And what I've observed. Remember. It, uh, Solomon kept saying that there's nothing new underneath the sun. And he was saying all of this is vanity. Because Solomon had gotten to the point. Where he was watching vain people. That chose vanity over victory. They chose the demonic over divinity. They chose pride over the power of God. They chose their flesh over the favor. They chose the mind of Esau 
over the mind of God. Esau didn't care that that meal was only going to last for a couple minutes. He had an inheritance that was eternal. But for a couple minutes, he was willing to negotiate, consider, entertain, compromise. Because Esau enjoyed the will of the devil more than the will of God. Saints, nobody is controlling what you become. You become what you chose to control. Nobody is controlling what you become. You become what you have chosen to control. Nobody is chosen what you become. Nobody, nobody, no one has chosen what you become. Nobody is choosing what you become. You become. What you have chosen to control. Nobody is controlling what you become. You become what you have chosen to control. Nobody is controlling what you become. You become what you have chosen to control. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 4 says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Verse 5 says, Better it is that thou should not vow, than thou vowest and not pay. Verse 6 says, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. I'm going to read this one more time. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Watch this here. Neither say before the angel that it was an angel, that it was an error. Wait a minute. Where's the angel? We're only surrounded by human beings, right? So there is an angel recording every word you speak. Things that you say when you offended. Things you say when you angry. Things you say when you're lustful. Things you say when you're weary. Things you say when you're jealous. Things you say when you're... The Bible says... Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Because the angel done took it down and recorded it. Look what it says. Wherefore should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? There's many people right now don't even know that this is in the word of God. The Bible says that God gets angry at people. When you let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. And God has an angel recording everything that you say sarcastically. Everything that you say when you think that you have an army behind you. You think that somebody else going to pity you. Let me just say this here to you as well. Be very cautious of people that amp you up. When you letting your mouth cause you to sin. Because those are one of your biggest enemies on earth. Oftentimes you look at people that support you in your carnality. And you think that they are your friends. They are demons in a body. If you going off at your manager at the workplace. And you go talk to that girlfriend at the lunch break. And she tell you I'm so glad you said it because somebody needed to say it. That is your biggest enemy at the job. If you go off at your boss and tell your boss, I'm not going to let you talk to me like that. We are both men and you're going to respect me as a man. And you go on the lunch break. And that other man come up to you and tell you, 
Man, you stood up for yourself. He need to learn to respect us as men. That is your biggest enemy at the job. People that amp you up to be carnal and people that amp you up to be a troublemaker, not a peacemaker. Those are your biggest enemies. People that revisit your situation and say, you should have said this. You should have gave them a piece of your mind. You shouldn't have let them felt like they got the upper hand. Don't let nobody talk to you like that. Don't let nobody do you like that. Those are your biggest enemies. People that teach you. To fight for yourself. Are the Judases in your life? People that teach you how to punch back. People that teach you how to go get your gun out of the glove department. People that teach, people that look at you and tell you. Here's a vocabulary you need to learn. Here's how you should have deal with this. People that train you how to deal with your trauma negatively, and they teach you how to deal with your wounds, with wickedness, those are your biggest enemies. Just remember that. If you never listen to another word I speak, just remember what I say. People that support me feeling good when I have done what is not good are my biggest enemies. You didn't hear what I said. I said people that support me in feeling good when I haven't done what was good are my biggest enemies. If I want to know who want to see me fail, let me look at the person that has encouraged my iniquity. Let me look at the person that has saluted my Satanism. If I want to know who is my biggest snake in my life, it's the person that applauds me. They applaud me. When God is rebuking me. Wow. It's the person that gives me compliments. When God is giving me constructive criticism. Oh my goodness. It's the person that's telling me that. I am this. When God is telling me I am that. Romans chapter 12 said, let, let no man think of himself more highly than he ought. My greatest enemy is the person that tells me To be still when God telling me to work. To be lazy when God telling me to develop. To be comforted with my corruption when God is telling me repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. My biggest enemies in life are people that can look me dead in the eye. When I'm dead. Oh my goodness. And disregard. My zombie state. See. The Bible says something mighty. Watch this here. Look what it says. In Proverbs. I want to take you here. I want you to see it in the word. Because I've been studying this. That's why I've been telling you all, I don't want none of you all to follow me without reading 
the book of Proverbs for yourself. As a matter of fact, November and December are Proverbs initiative months. I don't want nobody following me if you're not in one of the wisest books in the Bible. Because you're going to do foolishness. And Satan will trick you if you don't read the book of Proverbs. I, I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. If you don't read the book of Proverbs, you will fail God. Look what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 6. It says, forsake the foolish and live. Go in the way of understanding. Look at verse 7. It says, he that reproveth a scorner. Giveth to himself shame. And he that rebuketh a wicked man. Giveth himself a blot. Let me explain this to you. It says if you reprove a scorner, you give to yourself shame. Meaning the scorner will seek to shame you. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. You ever seen them parents that they tell their child, you can't go to the party. And they, they stand up to their parents and say, I see you up there dating all these people. You always going out on dates. And you up there, da, da. And as soon as they tell their child, you're not going to that party, their child start to shame them. Oh, you're not hearing me. Now, if they tell their child, hey, you could go to the party, the child will say, oh, thank you so much. I'm going to go buy my dress right now. Could you help me? I, and everything is good. Everything peaceful, boy. Satanic peace. But as soon as they start opposing their will, their will, I told you, it's the will. As soon as God start opposing your will, whoever is the God that you serve start to manifest. Because your will is linked to your master that you serve. The Bible says you can't serve two masters. Look. It says that he that reproveth a scorner get it to himself shame, which means that the scorner will now have a ministry to shame you. It becomes their whole objective to clap back at you. Because when you reprove them as a scorner, they don't like the atmosphere that atmosphere that it brought to them. They actually felt shamed. By the atmosphere. So now they say you give this atmosphere to me. I'm going to give it back to you. The Bible calls this person. Not a wise person. The Bible says that they are a scorner. Psalm chapter 1 verse 1 says. Blessed is the man that sitteth not. In the seat of the scornful. Which means that scorning. Is a position that Satan gives to people. That hate God. They hate righteousness and the way in which God does a thing. So Satan seats you in the heavenly places in this seat. When Satan sees that you match the energy of other demons, you match the energy of other principalities. They don't like God. You don't like God. They went against their original assignment and turned against God. You will get, go against your original assignment and turn against God. They hated the purpose why they was created. You hate the purpose why you was created. They join hands with people that enjoy disrespect to God. You join hands with people that enjoy disrespect to God. The scorner is a position that Satan anoints people to walk in when you hate wisdom. You hate instruction. It says, reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. No, no, verse 8 says, reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. It's saying that if you don't tell the scorner nothing, you're not going to see no manifestation of hate. If your mama 
Your daddy that don't serve the true and living God doesn't know that you have been converted and you believe on him. If they don't know that, they're still going to be claiming you as their daughter. They're still going to be claiming you as their son. It's when you start to yield to the Holy Ghost, now they want to disown you. Your children, as long as you go to the movies with them, as long as you talk about all the new rap songs, the latest hip-hop album, as long as you talk about Cardi B, as long as you talk about all of the secular information, you can coexist with your children. Is as soon as you operate in reproof, now they don't want to come over to come see you. They're avoiding you. They don't want to take your phone call. You text them. They still haven't responded yet. See, I'm a little too close to your house. So let me keep on going. And when they text you, you're going to feel good about it. But the text doesn't represent that they are of you and they're for you. When they finally respond back to you, you're going to feel good. Okay, at least they're okay. The Bible says, look what it says. Reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee. Which means that the scorner don't hate you if you don't reprove him. If you don't give them no rebuke, there's no problem. If you don't voice righteousness, there's no issue. Saints, let me tell you something about a righteous man. Let me tell you something about how the Holy Spirit wires a righteous man. There are things that the Lord will see. There, there'll be like 50 things that the Lord will see about you that are evil. But the Holy Spirit will tell the righteous man not to utter one thing. Did you know that? The Holy Spirit will tell the righteous man, don't say, don't, don't talk about this, don't talk about this, don't talk about this. But the Holy Spirit will converse with the righteous man. This person is doing this. They're doing this, they're doing this, they're doing this. And the righteous man won't even come to you about none of it at all. So by the time the righteous man comes to you on one thing, and your response is offense, anger, comparison, you don't even know. There's so much things that the righteous man didn't even say because they're giving you a chance to breathe. They're giving you a chance to repent. They're giving you a chance to become wise enough to hate evil. And when you don't even hate the evil and the righteous man comes up against you and they're like 50 stuff that the Holy Spirit doesn't talk to him about. And he comes to you on one thing and you you falter with just one thing. Imagine. The righteous man knows that you are a pawn for the devil. Because there's 50 other things he didn't say. Oh, he's calling you from a life of wasted years. Turn around, turn around. God is calling, he's calling you from a life of wasted years. 
Oh, turn around, turn around. God is calling. He's calling you from a life of wasted years. Oh, he's calling you from a life of wasted years. He's calling you Oh, from a life of wasted years. Oh, he's calling you. He's calling you from a life of wasted years. Turn around. Turn around. God is calling, he's calling you from a life of wasted years. He's calling you from a life of wasted years. He's calling you. He's calling you from a life of wasted years. Look at this here. It says, he that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. And he that rebuketh a wise man getteth himself a blot. Do you know what a blot is? A punch. A hit. Crucifixion. This is what the word of God says. If you rebuke a wicked man, they will seek to wound you back with their words. They will seek to hurt you. Now watch this here. A blot is what they was doing to Jesus when they punched him and said, prophesy who hit you. They put a blindfold over him. And they punched him. They said, if you really a prophet, prophesy to us who hit you. They was blotting him. They was beating him down. They was, they was, they was gang violencing him. Are you understanding this? It says if you rebuke a wicked man, they'll want to jump your soul. They'll want to punch your soul. Look at what verse 8 says. Reprove not a scorn unless he hates you. It says, rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. You see, these are two different reactions. You see, these are two different reactions. One is saying that if you rebuke a wise man, it says that he will end up giving you love. You rebuke a wicked man. It says that he'll end up giving you, he'll end up giving you hate. You see, it says that when you rebuke somebody that's wise, they'll love you all the more. They'll treat you with care and kindness. They'll do you no harm. They won't talk evil to you. They won't talk with your enemies. They won't seek to hurt, defame, destroy retaliate, get revenge. It says, but if you rebuke somebody that is a scorner, it says that they're going to fight back. They're going to talk back. They're going to seek to wound you. I want you to see this. Now look what it says right here. Let's go even further on this text here. Let's go even further on this text. Look what it says right here. It says, give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Look at verse 11. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. So watch this here. The seat of the scornful, when Satan anoints you in that seat, your lifespan is shortened. Are you hearing this? Watch this here. No, I'm showing you something in the text. It says that your days shall be multiplied and the years of your life shall be increased. So here's the mystery of why the Bible said, blessed is the man that sitteth not in the seat of the scornful. Because you shorten your days on earth. You expedite premature death. My goodness. My goodness. Are you catching this? Are you catching this? The Bible is literally saying that if you choose the seat of the scorner rather than the seat of the wise. Wow. It's saying that if you choose that seat if that's what you pick with your will, it says that that's what you are also accepting. You're accepting your lifespan being shortened. Look, for by me, thy days shall be multiplied and the years of your life shall be increased. Now, let me read this real slow. The years of your life shall be increased. Wow. Let's read further. That's what I'm telling you. I need all of you all to read the book of Proverbs. November and December. You have to study Proverbs with all your heart to the degree. If I was to call you and I say, I want you to come to Texas and do a broadcast with me. You better memorize a Proverbs scripture. If I was to ever do that. If I ever was to do a conference and I, pull, I pulled a, after the conference, I said, hey, I want you to do a broadcast with me. You better know Proverbs. Let's go further. It says, for by me, the days, your days shall be multiplied and the years of thy life shall be increased. It says, if thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. But if thou scornest, thou alone shall bear it. What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. I'm, I, I want you to remember this statement. See, when you are being wise, it benefits you fully. Like, like you, you know, there's some people saying, you know, I only submit myself. I only sow this seed for you. It ain't for me. No, no. That wisdom is for you. It's for you. It's for you. You ever hear people say, you know, I, I helped you. I served you. It was for you. It, no. It says that if you be wise, you are being wise for yourself. What the text is saying, this is beneficial fully for you. Yes, it benefits the person that enjoys you. Yes, it benefits the person that you're respecting. You're helping them out on the broadcast. You're sharing the broadcast. You're sowing seed to the ministry. You're coming to the conferences. You're promoting them, endorsing them. But it's telling you that ultimately the wisdom is for you. You are the one benefiting extra years on earth. You are the one benefiting health in your body. You are the one benefiting joy to your heart. You are the one benefiting protection from plagues, preservation from evil happenings. You are the one benefiting deliverance from evil people. You are the one benefiting having a peace with God. Peace with God. Hallelujah. Peace with God. He's a God of brilliant lights. He's the God 
a brilliant light is shining over us. He's shining over us. Now look, watch this. It says that if you be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. So get this narrative out your mind that when I do an act of wisdom, remember, an act of wisdom is always an act of self-control. It's always an act of unselfishness. An act of wisdom is always an act of unselfishness. It's an act of self-control, a self-restraint. So remember this. Whenever somebody operates in wisdom, don't regret it and say, oh, I did this for you. No. The Bible says if you be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. Now, let's go to the next part. It says, if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. Huh? What does this mean? It says, if thou scorn, thou alone shalt bear it. What does that mean? If thou scorn, Thou alone shall bear it. What does this mean in the text? It's saying that you won't be able to blame anybody when the judgment and the consequences come. Like you won't be able to say, I shouldn't be sick. I shouldn't have disease. I shouldn't have this poverty. I shouldn't have these issues. I shouldn't have these failures. I shouldn't have these hard times. Like you won't be able to include somebody else in the equation. It's going to fall on your own head. Miley Cyrus said, like a wrecking ball. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Look what it says right here. But if thou scornest, Thou alone shall bear it. Look what it's telling you. It's saying that you're going to take, you're going to have to endure all of the pain, all the consequences, all the curses that come along with scorning. It's saying that it's going to fall on your head and your head alone. It's not going to come to you and somebody. You're not going to be able to say, hey, give somebody 50% of, of the trials and the tribulations and the pains and the, the anguish. It's going, you're going to have to bear it all by yourself. You know, sometimes you join up with people and y'all, y'all do the evil together. But what it's saying, you might scorn with somebody else or something, but you're going to have to bear it all by yourself. Saints, these are life changing scriptures. You and them probably said the same thing. But when the consequence comes, you're going to bear it fully on your own hands. All right, saints, let's go even further. Verse 13 says, a foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. A foolish woman is clamorous. What does clamorous mean? A foolish woman being clamorous means that this woman argues with the will of God for her life. How many times have God placed you somewhere in your city to do something? And you decided this ain't meeting my preference. I need to do something else. I no, I no, it should be like this. I don't like it. it. It should be like this. Look what it says. A foolish woman is clamorous, meaning that she argues. She fights for her rights. She fights for her opinion. She fights for her dignity. But the Bible says she is simple. 
You, you know what another word is for simple stupid? The Bible says that she is stupid and she knoweth nothing. Why would she say, why would the Bible say she knoweth nothing? Because the word of God likens knowledge to a lifestyle that you created. So if we say that she knows the word, we would see the lifestyle that she creates is being inspired by the word. If we say that she knows Jesus, the lifestyle she creates will be influenced by the knowledge of Jesus. If we say that she's filled with the Holy Spirit, then the lifestyle that she creates would be influenced by being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says she knows nothing because the Entity who is nothing, Satan, is the influencer of this woman. So the Bible said that she knoweth nothing, which means that her lifestyle adds up to nothing. Her being nothing, her producing nothing. But I want you to catch the key word in this text, a foolish woman. Because in order for a woman to be foolish, it means that she doesn't see eye to eye with what God is handing her to complete. It means that she doesn't agree with her true purpose in this life. Which means that everything that God places on her plate for her to eat, she says, no, this is bothering me. No, this doesn't fit what I'm trying to become. I'm supposed to have children right now, and I'm getting older in age. No, 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 I don't want this on my plate that say that I don't have children because as a woman, uh, they told us that we all must have women. We all must have children. You see? So the next time you find yourself as a female, the Bible talking about a female right here in this text. You see, it was talking about the wicked man in the text is early, but now it's talking about the foolish woman. You see, Solomon did a complete sanctification of the foolish woman, which means that it was worthy to be separated in the text because he wanted to magnify a foolish woman must be discussed because I know that you're going to be tempted to be a foolish woman. I know that you're going to have different urges to be a foolish woman, but I'm showing you what is the result of being a foolish woman. It look. Look, look at this here. Look what it says. It says, for she sitteth at the door of her house. It says that she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city. She calleth passengers who go right on their ways. Watch this here. Whosoever is simple. Whoso, you know what this means? Whosoever is stupid. Whosoever is simple, let him turn into her. The last text says that her guests are in the depths of hell. Her guests. It says that the dead dwells with her. And they that are her guests, in verse 18, they are in the depths of hell. Which means that a foolish woman carries realms of the satanic if you listen to the opinion of a foolish woman, she will guide you to be promoted by Satan. She will show you how to be demoted by God. The Bible says that her guests are in the depths of hell. When you start to deal with a foolish woman, jealousy will rise up in you. You'll start hating people, even in a ministry. You'll start hating people in your city. You'll start hating people at your job, all because you listen to a foolish woman. You'll start being short-fused with your manager at the workplace, all because you listen to a foolish woman. After you listen to that foolish woman, now when the boss tell you to do something, you roll in your eyes, you having a temper. The boss like, what's going on? Are you okay? I am okay. I'm just saying you didn't tell Shaquana 
that she had to do that, but now you're telling me I have to do that. I just feel like you're, you're treating me different. How am I treating you different? See, but all because you listen to a foolish woman. You listen to a foolish woman, you will hate who you're supposed to love, and you will love who you're supposed to hate. You say, man, prophet, what you mean I'm supposed to love? I'm supposed to hate who I'm supposed to love. I ain't supposed to love that person. I'm supposed to hate them. David said, I hate people with a perfect hatred. Which means that I will not say I like this about them and God hates it about them. He dislikes it about them. What David was saying, what God dislikes about this person, I dislike it too. I'm not going to sugarcoat it or cut no corners and act like, no, 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 I like them. I enjoy them. No, I don't enjoy them because God doesn't enjoy them. And if God's in, God is enjoying them, I enjoy them as well. Look what it says right here. Her guests, her guests are in the depths of hell. So she's in the depths of hell. Because if they are your guests and you invited them into your realm and now they're in the depths of hell, that shows you. So understand this. When you operate in foolishness as a woman, you operate in the depths of hell. You operate in the depths of witchcraft. Now, saints, I want to talk to you in here for about two minutes. Avoid the Jezebel anointing. Jezebel had an anointing to hate the prophet. Her biggest hatred, though, was for Elijah. Because the word of the Lord he carried was so powerful. It affected her. It targeted her foolishness. Avoid the Jezebelic anointing. Because in that anointing, you are empowered with the spirit of pride and blindness. You can't see your own pitfall. Avoid the Jezebelic anointing. Remember, there is no woman that Jesus talked about repenting. Then in Revelation, I believe that's chapter 2. He said, I'm going to give you space to repent. Or I'm going to kill you and your children. The Jezebelic anointing, it causes a woman to take on assignments that she is not called by God to take on. Listen to me. When you have a Jezebelic anointing, you will start a Bible study when God ain't instruct you to start no Bible study. When you have a Jezebelic anointing, You'll start going to a college, learning theology. The Holy Spirit ain't sending you to the college to learn no theology. The Jezebelic anointing empowers you to be self-willed. You do things in your own timing, in your own way. How you want to do it, when you want to do it, with who you want to do it with. When you have a Jezebelic anointing, just because they came in your city, You'll be sitting down at lunch with them. You don't even care whether or not God wanted you to eat lunch with that person. You do your own thing with who you want to do, when you want to do it, where you want to do it. When you have a Jezebelic anointing, when your cousin comes to town, you're going to hang with them and do what y'all used to do. When you have a Jezebelic anointing, your family will still receive you. They won't outcast you. Because you're evil just like them. They don't see no difference. When you have a Jezebelic anointing, you will not acknowledge God in all your ways. God will not be the one directing your path. It will be housed in your own desires, housed in your own plans, housed in your own career. When you have a Jezebelic anointing, you will date when God wants you to be single. 
When you have a Jezebelic anointing, you will be loud when God wants you to be quiet. You'll be quiet when God wants you to be loud. Jezebel hated the prophetic anointing. She hated the word of the Lord. She hated when God spoke. Jezebel created a peace in her camp and she created prophets that they only spoke what she wanted to hear. If she wanted something to be proclaimed, the prophets of Baal, which were her slaves, See, a lot of people don't, they hear about prophets of Baal a lot, but I keep telling you, the prophets of Baal, their leader, their president was Jezebel and Ahab. But Jezebel was overseeing it. She was the prophet czar. You know the border czar? She was the prophet czar. Whatever she told them, that's what they prophesied. So they hated Elijah because the word of the Lord went against the prophecy. They hated Elijah and the prophets of the Lord because they would say things that made Jezebel feel upset. Like she was being picked on. Like she was being an outsider. Like she was being bullied. The Jezebel anointing will cause you to hate things that are supposed to have already been produced in your character. If you entertain the Jezebelic anointing, you will hate self-control. You will hate submission. I'm not going to tell you who, but there was somebody in my ministry they was working at a job. You'll never know who I'm talking about because I won't call their name. I won't embarrass them like that. They was working at a job and they said that a man came up to them. That is their boss. And they walked away from the man while he was talking to them, telling them what to do. I told them, what are you doing? You can't do that. I told them, you should have been dead to yourself by now. You can't disrespect your boss. You can't walk away from their face. Now, mind you, I don't want the person to feel any type of way. I ain't calling your name. Nobody know who you are. And nobody really could talk about you because they also have their own weaknesses and the things that they do as well. But I'm using this scenario as a perfect example. Oftentimes, we're entertaining the Jezebelic anointing as woman. I'm just pitting myself in y'all bracket. You entertain the Jezebelic anointing, you will act disrespectful to people that deserve your respect. You shouldn't be acting like that towards them. But if you're entertaining the Jezebel, Jezebel did not have any respect for divine placements and authority. Remember the man had a house? The other man didn't? Ahab didn't have that house? She went, go kill the man and said, Ahab, take the house. She didn't respect the fact that that man was over that house. She killed him. You know this in the Bible. She killed him in cold blood and told Ahab, go get the house. You didn't want to go do nothing to this man, but I did it for you. Jezebel was a very hard, cruel, wicked, evil, nonchalant woman. And let me say this to you. Um, you know, I don't want to bring no publicity. Um, I, I want to speak some uh, strong words right now, but I won't do it because the Holy Spirit told me there's a couple people screen recording me right now. It's all good. 
You screen record all you want, baby. But I don't want no unnecessary publicity if I say it in my rawest state of form. So let me say it in another format. Uh, Jezebel didn't give a care. Of how she got what she wanted. How she carried out her mental planning. By all means necessary, she was able to manifest whatever evil she contemplated on within. She was a go-getter of iniquity. My son's in here. Those of you all that's married or those of you all that's single, those of you all that are endeavoring to get married in the future, I want to leave you with this and remember this. Ahab empowered Jezebel. Because Ahab permitted the woman to remain evil after he met her. Ahab didn't fulfill his ministry towards his wife. There are men today, the reason why Jezebel flourishes is because of you. When God pitch you in her life to deliver her possibly from her evil, you become a participant of her evil. When Jezebel killed the man, Ahab never went to her and said, baby, you are wrong for killing this man. Don't ever do that again. He never rebuked her. He never said, hey, don't you ever kill somebody in cold blood. That is not right in the sight of God. He never rebuked her. He did not love Jezebel. He let her commit evil after evil. And he was in agreement with what she did. And as long as she did evil, and he never rebuked her. There was peace in their marriage. They had good meals together. They ate, they laughed, they talked. Because Jezebel, as long as the will of Satan increases, Ahab was going to experience no no sad wife. The Bible said when she met Elijah. Now watch this here. I'm going to shock you with this revelation. I ain't never say this before. The true husband of Jezebel was an Ahab. It was Elijah. The evil man, as long as she was married according to the flesh, that evil man will permit her to remain who she was before she met him. 
But when she met Elijah, she said, now this man is a trouble of Israel. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to cut his head off. The Bible said in Ephesians 5 that the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Oh, my gosh. So you tell me, why was she aiming at his head? Because she didn't even have a head. Anytime she experienced a head showing up, she wanted to cut it off. Because all Jezebel's life, she was the head of her own life. So when she met somebody that was ahead, she said, I'm going to cut his head off. When she met other prophets before him, she went go cut the head off. Because she was threatened by wherever a head would appear. She never sought to kill Ahab because Ahab wasn't ahead. You got to excuse me. See, you heard my Prince Hills? I had to do a little dance just now. You, you, you got to excuse me. You heard my Prince Hills? Huh? You ain't never heard that before. If she would have married Elijah's anointing, Jezebel could have repented and got delivered. If she would have married the mindset he had, she could have got converted to a new woman, a woman that she had never been a day in her life. She could have got set free. Hallelujah. Just think about this. But Jezebel called and Ahab called him a troubler, a troublemaker. Which means every time you tell us the will of God, you're stirring up trouble. Every time you give me wisdom, you're making me mad. Every time you tell me what God wants me to do and what God doesn't want me to say, you are irritating me. You notice Ahab was okay with his wife being evil. He didn't love her. Saints, let me show you this, and this is so profound. When you come into this earth, you only love people that love the evil you. You only love people that accept your flaws that are at peace with your iniquity. But the only people that truly love you in this life is the person that gives you the wisdom of God and the understanding of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 4 says, in all you're getting of wisdom, get understanding. In all you're getting of wisdom, get understanding. Wow. Wisdom is the principal thing. Elijah came to give Jezebel wisdom. Jezebel said, I'll cut your head off. Miriam. Moses came to give her wisdom, but she got a Jezebelic anointing. Miriam said, is it only him that God talked to? God talked to me too. Aaron, you's a man of God. God talked to you too. He want us to do everything he says, and he want us just to obey his voice whenever he speaks. God gave us a ministry. He talks to us too.
You see in the word of God, King Ahasuerus said, Vashti, come show yourself. She told the maids, you go tell him what I said. I'm not coming to show myself. We see the woman in the Bible that engaged the Jezebelic anointing. They became very, 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 very self-entitled and disrespectful. They wanted to show authority. I'm going to cut your head off. No, 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 you might have told me to do that, but I'm going to show you I ain't doing it. No, you might have told me that I'm not supposed to be dating in my city, but I'm going to show you I got my boyfriend. I got my girlfriend. No, no, you might have told me that I'm not supposed to create relationships in the workplace, but guess what I'm going to do? I'm not only going to create relationships, I'm going to create a bedroom relationship with my coworkers. I'm going to call them over. They're going to call me over. We're going to hang out real good. You see, the Jezebelic anointing means whatever you instruct me is wrong, I'm going to show you I'm going to do it. And I'm going to show you that I'm going to do it with great pride and dignity. I, I greatly boast that I'm about to do it. I'm going to show you. When you engage the Jezebelic anointing, you take warning. And you ball it up and throw it in the trash. Kobe, you shoot it right there in the trash. You take the warnings of the Lord. He's telling you, don't do it. Don't say that. Don't connect with them. Don't go back to your former life. And you go right back. Let your light so shine, daughter. Let your light so shine. Let men see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. No, no, no. Ain't no light around me. I'm a city girl. I'm a savage working for the Dallas Mavericks. <laughs> I'm a savage. Mark Cuban, Dallas Mavericks. Huh? Savage. Like my collard greens and some cabbage. <laughs> I'm a savage. I like some collard greens and some... I like some collard greens and some... I like some collard greens and some cabbage. <laughs> I like some collard greens and some, and some cabbage. Avoid the Jezebelic spirit. <laughs> Avoid the Jezebelic spirit. Avoid the Jezebelic spirit. Avoid the Jezebelic spirit. Woman, you must know that you was created by the Holy Spirit to be powerful as you are born again. When you come into the world the first time, the Jeze Jezebelic realm is easy for you to access. You just follow your own way. You just do your own thing. But the Holy Spirit will call you at one point. And he'll call you and he'll offer you life. He'll offer you freedom and value. He'll attempt to upgrade you, to beautify you. He'll take away your sins, your wrong dealings, your wrong past. He'll heal your wounds, your scars, your traumas. He'll plant your feet on solid ground and give you a chance to recover all. 
I'm telling you, avoid the Jezebelic anointing at all costs because you'll undo everything that you have produced in the spirit. And there'll come a day where the Bible said that the dogs lick Jezebel blood. What does that mean? Dogs licked her blood. The word of God says, Jesus said, don't give what is holy to dogs. So there's a realm of dogs. It represents people that wisdom is too high for them. Dogs, in one sense, represent that the mystery of God is not being revealed to them. They're not privileged to know it because their heart is too hardened. Just think about this. What does it mean? So dogs, it didn't say cats or birds or tigers. It said that dogs licked her blood, which means that the dogs, they had oneness with Jezebel's bloodline. They was not allowed into the mysteries of God, neither was Jezebel. Wisdom was too high for the dogs. Wisdom was too high for Jezebel. The word of the Lord was too precious for the dogs. The word of the Lord was too precious for Jezebel. And lastly, dogs represent a dogmatic disrespectful reaction to God's attempt to purge you to the next level of bearing fruit. Dogs represent being dogmatic, sarcastic. When God is trying to do a work in your life in your city, you take him for granted. You walk all over his kindness and his goodness and his mercy. You talk with the words of someone that's haughty, that's high and lifted up. You have no humility within yourself. Seeking to pleasure God. And dogs represent being a scorner. Dogmatic. Remember. When they licked her blood. They was able to digest. What was in Jezebel's blood. The same dogmatic. The same disrespectful. And the same sarcastic. Haughty spirit. They was able to digest it because it matched their realm. She had a scorner in her blood. She had a person that was disinterested in God in her blood. Are you seeing this? So always remember this from now on. Whenever the Holy Spirit is breaking you away from the Jezebelic anointing, he's showing you how to fear him. The Bible says that beauty is vain, favor is deceitful, but a woman that fears the Lord shall be praised. Think about it. A woman that fears the Lord. The fear of the Lord, it is on the other side. It breaks off any Jezebelic anointing. It breaks off when you reverence and show respect, when you show honor, when you bridle your tongue, when you live a certain way in your city, in your apartment, in your neighborhood, in your housing, in your workplace. You are rejecting the Jezebelic anointing. When you choose to walk in lowliness and holiness, you are rejecting the Jezebelic anointing. For now on, pray to the Father. If you are a woman, pray to the Father that you would be delivered from the Jezebelic anointing. Pray. 
that you would detach yourself from the altar of Jezebel. Pray, pray, pray. No, 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 pray. Pray, pray, pray. Pray, pray, pray. You need to pray. Let the mind that's in Christ be also in you. That's what Mary Magdalene did. She wanted no parts with the bloodline of Jezebel. I want to say something real powerful to you. The mind of Jezebel is one of the highest bloodlines that opposes a female. Are you hearing me? It's the matriarch demon, the high place demon. That's, that's, that's what it is. It's the matriarch demon. You like my shoes? It's the matriarch demon. <laughs> it's the matriarch demon. It's the high place demon. It's the high place. Make me more like you. Make me more like you. Make sound is correct. Can you hear? Can you hear? I hope the sound is correct. Wonderful, 
your power fall, the only one, make me more like you. Make me more like you. Your mighty, wonderful. You're powerful, the only one. You are mighty, wonderful, powerful, the only one. Make me more like you. Make Make me more